Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Radically Loved, the Radically Loved podcast. I am temporarily hosting it for you. This is Tessa. Uh, Rosie is doing her usual creation of amazing content for Headspace and settling into her new life and her new home in LA. Um, And so I just want to say thank you for continuing to support us and and listen. And we are so honored to have Robin Moreno on the show today, who um, Rosie a while back, if you had the chance to listen, was actually on Robin's podcast called Get Rooted, which is an amazing episode um, where Rosie and Robin talk about Rosie's book, you are radically loved. So I'll put a link to that into the show notes today. Um, But without further ado, I wanted to introduce you to Robin, who is a former Today Show contributor and former co-president of Latina Media Ventures. She has interviewed Maria Hinojosa, Eva Longoria, Dolores Huerta, Cecilia Richards, Cheryl Sandberg, Young Pueblo, Rihanna, among many others. And she's also an in-demand meditation teacher, and she's presented at things such as the Sundance Film Festival, South by Southwest, and the Omega Institute, as well as, as I mentioned, podcast host Get Rooted and the author of her book that's coming out June 6th. Oh, I'm so excited for you, Robin. The book is called Get Rooted. So Robin, how are you doing today? Congratulations on bringing this baby into the world. We're excited for you. Can't wait to dive in. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, um, Tessa and Rosie and all of your listeners. I'm a big fan of the Radically Love podcast. And it's such an honor to be here to talk about my book. It's funny because the last time I talked to Rosie, which I think was last year when her book came out, um, was so exciting. So when you do a book, it's really like a baby. It's like hard and emotional and laborious. And then you deliver it to the world and you let your baby go. And that's basically what I'm leading to. And it's a really beautiful process. Um, and that's, we could talk about just writing a book that's, it's probably deserves its own, um, podcast, but it's a journey. And the book actually is about a journey that I took. So, um, I hope people will, will buy it and enjoy it. It's about a spiritual journey that I embarked on several, several years ago now after, and thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, I, was doing, I would say several years ago, I was a media person. I was sort of like, probably, you know, I fancied myself anyway, like hashtag mom boss, uh, you know, doing a lot of different media. I was running an organization. Um, I was uh, on morning shows a lot. I was, you know, at empowerment conferences a lot. Like that was the world that I was in. I was in media for over 20 years, doing a variety of things from writing books to um, hosting shows. I was nominated for an Emmy and also writing has always been my love. Um, but things, Tessa, came to a head um, where, and probably not unlike people that are listening, you know, we, I was busy, I was overperforming, I was overwhelmed, I was overfunctioning, um, and I just completely hit a wall. I totally hit a wall. And so um, that's when I hit that wall and had sort of what I guess was like maybe my rock bottom moment. That's when I had a real big epiphany and realized that I needed a break. I needed to take a pause. Um, I needed to stop running. Um, I needed to look back so I could look forward. And that that whole um, pausing and journey is really the catalyst and what what's in this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And this book, um, from what I've seen, is just it's a little bit different approach to the other work because you do have a few other books out in publication, right? So 
as I was looking at this book, it seems like a little bit more personal, closer to home. Um, it relates to you know, like personal meditation practices, but also um, comes from some traditions and rituals that you glean from like um, current, I'm going to say this wrong, curandissima, curandissima, the healing. Uh, yeah, so it's called curanderissimo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so curanderissimo is, um, and that curanderismo is a word that means the way of healing. So uh, a curandera, curandere, curandero is um, someone that heals. That's traditionally, that's that's what the word is. And curanderismo just means a way of healing. Um, and traditionally, this is just the ways of healing that have been you know, happening in the Americas, right? Um, since before conquest and then has evolved as we've evolved, right? So with like um, the, the mixing of our people and the blending of all of these religions that came, that's what curanderismo is. And so when I refer to curanderismo as a Mexican-American person from the Southwest, I'm referring usually to to uh, like traditional medicine of Mexico. Um, and it's really interesting because in this process where I was really burnt out and I was like missing my kids, like their uh, big moments. I had this specific, I had a specific moment, Tessa, where I was like, you know, you just have those moments in life and you're like, it just crystallizes. Like, what are you doing? And there was this moment where I was uh, the editor in chief of this organization. I had just been promoted to co-president. Uh, we were really busy. It was really stressful. And um, it was Christmas. It was our Christmas party. It was a company Christmas party. And it was the exact same day as my daughter's um, preschool recital, which she like her holiday recital where she had been for like weeks and maybe even months practicing her little four and five year old songs, right? Like let it snow um, and Frosty the Snowman. And she was so excited and she was so proud and the company party was the same day and it was like uh and this is not uncommon right so working people across the world it's like that constant struggle of choices like we just constantly have to make all of these just you know frankly just sucky choices and so my whole body tessa was like and I was exhausted I was so tired I was just physically tired I was mentally tired I was sp spiritually tired um I was commuting four hours a day to this job. And I was like, I just don't want to go. I, I just, just, I knew what I had to do. And yet I didn't do it. All right. And how often do we know in our bodies what the right thing is, what we want to do? Our whole body is screaming, don't do it, do this. And yet obligation, um, what we think we should do, you know, society, people's pressure, we override ourselves and do the thing. And so that's what happened. And so I overrode every instinct in my body that was like, show up for your kid. She's so excited. You want to be there. You can say no. And I didn't. I felt this obligation as a people leader in this organization that I should be there. Like, that's what was expected of me. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm working on people pleasing and things like that. But I just felt like I had to do this. And so I went to the company party, ended up drinking so much because I was so stressed out and so guilty that I was drinking. I was stress drinking. I just didn't want to be there. So I was like physically trying to drown my discomfort and my disease uh, with tons of wine. So I was like drinking and drinking, drinking. I didn't want to be there. And so I had told uh, my sister, look, go for me um, and FaceTime and I'll, I'll go there. Like at some, like, I don't know, I'll make it work. And so I like, at this point, I was totally buzzed, like took my wine in the bathroom stall, closed it. I'm sitting on a toilet, putting my wine glass on like that silver toilet paper dispenser. And I'm watching my kid and she's like doing great. She's crushing it. And she's like looking out and I'm imagining that she's maybe looking out for me and she wouldn't see me. Right. She would just, she couldn't see the phone from there. And, uh, you know, I just was like, like, what am I doing? Like, what am I literally doing? Like, I am missing my life. I am doing this wrong. There's, I'm, I don't know, but there's something really phenomenally wrong about a lot of this, this, this encapsulated. There was a hundred more instances like that. Just a hundred more decisions that I felt like I was just doing it all wrong. And I was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. 
I, I just can't, I cannot do this anymore. Um, and that I think like something broke in me where I was like, I can't. And so I ended up, and it was, it was months later, I ended up quitting the job. And instead of getting another one, I was like, I'll be a freelancer. I need to work. I don't have, I don't come from wealth. Like I don't have, you know, my parents aren't going to give me money. I have to work. And so I was like, I'll just be a freelancer. I have money saved, but I need to get a hold of myself because there's something in me that is just like sad. Like there's a part of me that is just very hurting and it's been hurting. And I think the reason I was overworking so much is, and what I was over drinking is that I was trying to hide or mask or fill this big hole that I felt. And so I ended up going, um, I quit my job and I have, a, I have cousins and they, uh, they, have, they, one of them has a house in Mexico and she's like, come with me to Mexico. And so I went to Mexico and I was studying curanderismo because one of my cousins was studying this medicine of my great grandmother. My great grandmother was a curandera, which is like a medicine woman, a, a healer. Um, and I knew this, but I just didn't, it sort of just didn't compute to me. It just felt really old fashioned. And so, but I started to like, you know, the way that something will come back into your like, I don't know, your uh, surroundings and it'll land on you when you're ready. And so my cousin was starting to go to the day small. She was starting to be a curandera. I went to, I don't know, a seminar or a workshop. And the teacher, um, one of the required readings was this book called Woman Who Glows in the Dark. Um, and it is about a, it's a, it's a beautiful book. So I'll, I'll say it again. And if you can put it in the show notes, but it's called Woman Who Glows in the Dark. And it's by Elena Avila. And she is a um, Mexican-American, Texas-born nurse turned curandera. And she tells her story of how she moved back to this medicine of her grandmother's and how it healed her. And so I'm so I'm on the beach. I'm like, barely can catch my breath. I quit my job. But you know, some, you know how like you're like, you're drowning and then you actually make it to shore, but you're still panting because you still feel like you're drowning. Like I had quit, but I still was like super activated in my body. And I was still used to being, you know, I was in digital media and I had two phones and I was still like super activated. So I was like, <laughs> and so I was just like trying to calm myself. And a woman who goes in the dark, I'm reading and she says this thing. She said, you know, we have this condition in my culture called susto and you spell it S-U-S-T-O. And in Spanish, susto means um, a fright right? Or a scare to scare. But she's like, but this is called a magical fright. And what this means is we we see this as a soul loss. So when something happens to you, um, that's traumatic, a piece of your soul freeze or it flees, right? So it freezes or it flees. Um, and you feel as if you're incomplete, or you're not there, right? And maybe this is similar to like, say, a post traumatic stress disorder or something like that, where you just you don't feel you just feel sort of a goneness. There's like a, a disassociation or something. And she said, you know, I know that in my culture, we've always known that just the way that the body can be wounded, that, um, you know, that your, your soul can be wounded. And we call this a soul loss, which is susto. And so to heal it, you have to go on a soul retrieval. And when I read these words, Tessa, I was like, that's it. That's, that's what I have my whole life. I've always felt this way. And it doesn't matter. It didn't matter if I went to therapy. It didn't matter if I went to eight day silent retreats. It didn't matter that I have two yoga certifications. Uh, it didn't matter that I ran a marathon. It didn't matter that I was vegan. Uh, it didn't matter that I had beautiful children that I loved. It did not matter that um, I was in a good marriage. Um, it didn't matter that I did all these shiny things, right? That my bio looks really good. You know, I, right. I looked sort of, but I still, what people couldn't see is that something I, I was, I felt something was missing and it felt as if I had this undiagnosed thing that someone probably gave in that finally gave me a name for it. Finally, I had a name for this condition and it was called susto. I had soul loss and I needed to get my soul back. And I felt that on that beach in Mexico, my whole body woke up. It was like, it was, it was a remembrance. It was, my body said, yes. Every cell in my body said, yes, this is it. This is what's happening. And this is what you have to do. And then weirdly, things came together rather quickly. I, all of a sudden, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to go on a soul retrieval. I'm going to retrieve pieces. What should I do? I started writing down um, and I started getting ideas and I was excited. And I was like, 
my dad died when I was 13 years old. He died very quickly. Um, he died in 260 days. Um, and I'm going to learn about him. I'm going to learn about my great grandmother, my abuelita, who was a curandera. Her name is Mama Natalia. I knew her. I luckily, I was really lucky that I actually knew her and I was nine year old when she passed, but I don't really know what curanderismo is. Like I know, I do know, like, I, I don't know. My mom rubs an egg on me and things like this, but what does this mean? Like, what's the deeper meaning and what is the application? What's the science? What's the wisdom uh, around this medicine of my grandmother's that I'm at this point, honestly, totally disconnected from. Um, and what are all the, how can I find my way back home? And so I began to sort of make this plan. Um, and, you know, I'm like that. I'm a, I make, I'm a plan maker and I'm like, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to make a plan for my healing. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this blueprint. And I found out, I was trying to find out frames for time. And I found out that the uh, Mexica, which is when people, uh, you know, the Aztecs, people refer to them as the Aztecs, but they never called themselves the Aztecs. Um, I think uh, historians do, or anthropologists, but they themselves, um, the Aztecs, they call themselves the Mexica. Mm -hmm. So the Mexica and also the Maya had two calendars. One was a 365-day solar calendar, but one was a 260-day, more like divination calendar. And that was like 260 days. And like I said before, my dad died. He was diagnosed with late stage pancreatic cancer. It was terrible. It was devastating. The time from his diagnosis to the time to his death was 260 days. And he died on Valentine's Day. And so I said, can I can I do another journey, you know, and maybe I don't parallel this maybe, except mine is going to be like a rebirth because the, the 260 days actually is, um, it's symbolic of the gestation period of a baby. Um, and so it's this idea that there it's, it has a, it has a connotation of rebirth. Right. Yeah. And so I said, I'm going to do this. And so I, I did this and it was hard and it was profound and it, I cha it was changed and I continue to change because even though I, a lot happened, much more happened afterwards because like any healing, um, it's cyclical and it, nothing is just like 260 days and you're done. Like that, I just touched the iceberg, but that's what the book is about. Um, and I've been on that journey since and I continue um, to have cycles of healing. Huh. Wow. What a story. Okay. So a couple of follow-up questions. One, I'm curious if you came across any research, um, as you were looking at the 260 days in the Aztec calendar versus the 365 days, what was the thought? Pro like I, that makes total sense. 260 days, the gestation period for a baby to come to fruition. Was there any sort of literature around why 365 days in a calendar year? I mean, I think 365 day follows a solar calendar. So okay. I don't know if that's some sort of like, I mean, I think back then and I, right, everything was about like the stars and the cycles and the passage of Venus and, um, you know, moon cycles and sun cycles and how often they cycle. And so I know that the sun, the 365 day does and that's one I think we more or less use today now, like a Gregorian calendar, which is that's more commonly used. 260 day, I had never heard of anything like that. So that was super intriguing to me. And it's yeah. called Nahuatl, it's called the Tonal Poali. Um, and that is like, that's again, it's more of a divination calendar. Like if you're born on this day, um, this is the sign and, th you know, this is a good day for this, or you have like these characteristics um, but for me, and, and people can stu study the Tonopoali forever. Like it's a very complex, these are complex ideas. And I didn't know any of that. Um, even back then, now I know a little bit more, but like, you know, not, not tons. But it was really, I would say, the idea that 260 days, 260 days is, does signify like the growth of humans and that like birth cycle, like that really spoke to me. And honestly, even more, Tessa, when I looked at a calendar and I was like trying to map this out, I was looking calendar and I was doing this, um, I think it was in April. And again, this was several years ago now. And I was like, let me think about dates. And I was like, should I start on my birthday? My birthday's in June. I was going 260 days and I ended up somewhere where in February. And then I thought Valentine's Day and Valentine's Day has always had 
such a really melancholy significance for me because it's the day that my dad died, but it's a day of love. And we are like, it's so much love and I love love. And, but then he died. And so for the longest time, I hated Valentine's days. It was for a long time. I hated it. And so I, I was like, let me do this. And so I was like, what's 260 days from February 14th backwards. Right. And this was only going to be a few weeks from where I was at that time. And that day was May 31st. And the only, after my dad died, because he died so quickly, I was only 13 years old. We were left reeling. We didn't have any therapy. We did. We just literally put on black clothes, went to school and never talked about it again. Like it was just, that's what we, we did back then. That was, I guess what we did in my culture. I don't know. That's what my mom did. Um, bless her heart. She was, you know, less than 40 and had four kids. But the only day, so when I asked her much later about, you know, my dad and his illness, the only date that she could ever recall was May 31st, because that's when he had to go get surgery to see where his diagnosis was. And in after the surgery, um, the oncologist came out and told my mom, devastatingly, there's nothing more we can do for him. We've done all we can. We've done what we can here. And it's, it's dire. He, he's going to, he has less than one year to live. And she was just like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you saying? And he died 260 days later. And so that's what the significance, like when I was looking at these things, I was just like, as if somebody was leaving me clues, you know, because I kept like, things were coming together really quickly and really like, like, interestingly, like, okay, let's do this. We, we Let's do the soul retrieval. This makes sense. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take it. Like I can't do this forever, but I'm going to do it for like a truncated period of time. 260. Oh, wait, hold on. My dad died in 260 days the birth of the baby. Okay. This is cool. Okay. Like it was just, it was starting to formulate like a path, like a path was being revealed to me. And I really feel very much, honestly, that I think ancestors were, were, were spirit, something, was saying that you do this, do this. I don't know where it's going to end up, but we're calling you to do this. And so I answered the call. Wow. That's so cool. I love that. I'm trying to visualize this map because this is such a unique idea. And I think about this as um, what, what this has me thinking about is um, the idea of like a retrospective on New Year's instead of setting New Year's intentions, you know, January 1st or December 31st or whatever, but like retrospectively looking back over the year and kind of giving yourself a postmortem, I guess, over the past year. And so I'm thinking, this is, I guess, a two-part question. I'm trying to visualize this map that you're creating for yourself. And I'm wondering, you know, if you started with a particular, it sounds like the overarching theme is healing, right? You're healing yourself. You realize, okay, there's a departure from my soul. Um, I want to reconnect with that soul and I want to be whole. I want to heal myself. And so how did you, I mean, I get, I get the concept that you're a planner and I can so appreciate that as I'm a planner too. I've never thought of applying it to my healing though. (laughs) So I'm trying to figure out like, which I think is genius. I'm trying to figure out what this map looked like for you in the beginning. And then is this like a roadmap for the book, the way that the table of contents laid is laid out, for example, because we have the four directions, right? And then we have the fifth direction. And so that's kind of a convoluted question and it's a multifaceted question, but I was wondering if you could speak to these ideas of mapping out. And then also I do want to touch on the layout of the book. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question. And it's, I have to say, it was, again, it, it was also, it really speaks, Tessa, to where I was at this point in my life. It really does. Like the book is so, it's so revealing to me even now. Like it's, it really is. I'm like, I look at it and I read a part and I'm like, oh my God. Um, but I would say the kind of person that I was several years ago is that I was very, goal oriented honestly and and i looked at healing as a destination as like 260 days 
And we're going to, we're going to, we, we're going to get this. We got this, you know, like 30 days to a better body, right? Like you know what I mean? 30 minute meals. <laughs> yeah. Like I really, I also worked at women's magazines for a long time. So I'm not going to lie. I'm sure there's a part of me that really knows how to package things. And so I was like, this is it. I'm packaging this healing journey and we're going to do 260 days. And th- we're going to, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, and I, and so I did it. I really, I, I, that's what I thought. And so I was like, I looked and so I had different areas and I was like, I want to learn about my dad. I want to learn about my grandmother. I want to learn about curanderismo. I want to learn about food. I want to get healthier. I want to reconnect to my body. I want to reconnect to nature. I want to um, touch on finances. So it literally kind of is like almost like all women's interest, like magazine stuff, right? But also the thing that I think that could be really relevant for women. What I found out really quickly is that nothing went as planned. Like nothing went as planned. It was harder. It was messier. It was more painful. It was more delightful. It was just, it was, it was like, I made this amazing plan. And then I had to basically tear it up and just keep walking. Right. And I think that's really normal. Like you need the thing to get you started. Like maybe you need the app to, you know, meditate every day. Right. You need probably you need an entry point. And that's where I was. I don't I don't I'm not, I don't begrudge that girl. I love that girl. I needed that girl to get to this girl. But that girl was very like that. Right. Um, another thing that I did use and I still use and I think it's really helpful. And I think that all of us can use is what I realized that was really central to um curanderismo and this this belief and a lot of uh, beliefs of my ancestors. Right. The Mexica um, was nature nature is healing nature is a guide and so they have the five they look to the directions a lot and this is actually this is cross-cultural i i have a friend um that studies traditional chinese medicine and they also have and when i'm when i'm saying the directions i'm talking about the cardinal points so i'm talking about the east and the west and the north and the south and so across culture we've always looked to the sky because that's what we had, right? That was how we navigated our way. And I was navigating my way on a journey, right? So if you think of like a way, a wayfinder that's sailing, they're going to look to the stars to navigate. And so I lay the book out and I navigated my way with the directions. Um, And the meaning that I was taught um, was that you start in the east. The east is where the sun rises. The east is a place of beginnings. The east is where you have hope, right? Every day, you know what? You had a shitty day. Guess what? The next day you wake up, the sun rises. It's a new day. It's a fresh start. It's a blank page. And so that's where I started. And so I started in my home. I started cleaning. I started doing energetic cleansings. I started learning about curanderismo. And then traditionally in my, um, in my studies, you would go to the West. The West is where the place where the sun sets and you let go. But I was called to go to the North. And so by then I started studying um, about uh, like doing ancestry on my lineage and my dad and who was he besides just my dad and and my great grandma? And I started and I built um, an altar, which for me, that makes sense for, for my culture and my lineage. Um, but that could be, you know, a, a meditation corner, a place of contemplation for someone else um, where I began to connect with ancestors. Like, who are these people? Who am I? You know, what is my history and how is this connection? What's good? And what do I want to leave behind? Whenever you look back, like there's things that you're really proud of and all these resilient people. And there's also ways that we have brought forward that maybe we don't need. I don't need this anymore. I don't need that legacy. I don't need these habits. And so that was what I did a lot in the North was like kind of parsing through that. And then weirdly enough, again, like ancestrally guided, I think, that led me to the West because then I was ready to let go. And then I moved to the West, which is where the sun sets. And that's where you let go of things. And there I let go of many things. I let go of habits. Um, you know, I don't want to give the book away, but there was things that I, I really did let go of ways of being that I thought were part of my identity that weren't. And then I moved to the direction of the South, which is the North is ancestors. The South is children and the belief of the child and willpower and play and then you end in after having made what I think of as like sort of a circle then you sort of step inside 
And that's the fifth direction, which is community and connection. Because this entire time, I kept thinking, you know, and I think maybe people can relate to this. Like when you're depressed, when you're anxious, when you're not feeling good, when you have trauma, when you have gone through stuff, you feel alone. You feel like alone. Like I'm the only person in the world that this has happened to or no one really knows what's happening happening with me. They only see what I show them. And that happens on social media, right? We only show certain parts of ourselves. We're hiding things. And what I realized in this journey is I had to stop hiding because I can't heal what, right? I can't heal what I'm hiding. And I can't ask for help if I'm hiding. And I needed help. This was not a journey I did alone. It would, I didn't write the book alone. I'm not like you're helping me. Like none of, if I learned nothing else, none of this healing is in the collective. It's a collective endeavor. We heal together. And there were so many people that helped me. And that was the, that was the sort of fifth and final direction. Um, and that's the layout of the book. And so in that capacity, I go to I go to these directions all the time. You know, I visit them all the time, and I work with them all the time. But you know, the 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 uh, and I'm in another cycles, more cycles of healing. But you know, that planning girl with that genius idea um, to get to destination, I found out pretty quickly that that just all fell apart, and that healing is a journey and not a destination. Yeah. So when you had that moment on the beach in Mexico. Is that was that the inception of this book? Looking back, did you know you were going to create a book out of this, or did that kind of evolve over time during your healing journey? Something was born in that moment. It really was. Something was born. An idea was was planted. I, I definitely when I read those words of susto, and I, I had that recognition of my own soul loss, and we, you know, and I, that there could be healing at the soul level. I knew that I was going to do this um, because I am a writer. I wrote the entire time. So I was taking notes the entire time, but I didn't, I think I always wanted it to be a book, but at some point, and I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, anyone that's written a book could understand this or anyone that's been on a journey, like your reasons for doing things like your motivations change. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um I I think I always had the idea of a book and then I dropped it weirdly enough. And and I and I had to drop that idea because I had to just live into it without maybe no one would ever know about it. You know what I mean? Like maybe no one was ever going to yeah. know what happened to me. And so it's like I had to actually really drop that. But I have to be honest and say that for I think that I I held that identity that I would do something with this for a while because I had just come from, I had left a job and I, I was really tied to my identity as this is what I do. And I just have to be honest because I think I, I thought, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm, a, I'm writing a book. Like, again, like I had to put purpose into it. And it wasn't until somewhere when the healing probably started working or I started to fall apart or something where I was like, just stop, like, let go of this idea of identity, let go of just be here, just be here. And that's, I think, when things really began to evolve. That's probably when I actually started to heal. And then much later, much later, after I would say a few cycles of healing, did I think, okay, let me revisit this. Let me see if there, you know, if I could make this into a story that's interesting for people. Um, and, and, and am I ready to share this? Because I think it's a really honest thing to say and we're, we're sort of, I don't know, we're in this age of oversharing, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I feel like you go on TikTok Tuesday and everyone's telling you their life story. So I don't know. I'm kind of like maybe old fashioned or something. But I was just like, you know, does everyone need to know this or is can this just be for me? And I feel like that's a really healthy point for ever, anybody where they are. Like, you know, do I need to share this or is this just something that I did? And I think that's a really, I think it was a beautiful thing because I was really respectful of my journey and I was really honoring of all that hard stuff. And so I had to sort of go there. So I don't know, that was a very convoluted answer, but <laughs> my I convoluted that, question. I, yeah. think it, <laughs> I thought, yeah, like, yes, this is a book. And then somewhere I was like, no, just drop your attachments, just do it. 
And then I had to sort of parse through it and, but yes, but eventually it did turn into a book, but it was, it was a long and hard process. I have to say, and I'm saying that because for people, anyone out there that hopefully wants to write a book and we need all the stories. So I really encourage anyone out there that's listening, that feels like they want to tell a story or they had a journey that was similar because we all go on these journeys, whether we call them journeys or not. Right. Like we look back and we're like, holy cow, how did I get from here to there? And that is always so interesting to me. I'm always like, how, how did you do that? How did you go from that to that? Like, and people want to know. And so I really so strongly encourage you, especially if you're women, if you're a woman of color, uh, like 8% of like, like Latine write books, like 8% of um, black people write books. It's just not a lot. So especially I feel like those stories as a person, um, you know, that identifies as a person of color. Like I, I just am always like so hungry to see myself in books and stories. And so, but we need all the stories. And so I encourage you to write the stories, but ask those questions, you know, like, why am I doing this? You know, what's my why, you know, and, and, and ground your root yourself in that. And then, and then it's a good place to, to write and share. And then you can share um, in a way that feels rooted to you. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for saying that. I think it's so true. I think so often we stop ourselves from doing something because we already see it out there in the world. Like we, we see, oh, a similar story or the story you had in your head, somebody else already wrote it. But there's so like you, everyone has their own unique voice and their own way to tell that story and their own lens. And there's someone, I guarantee it, Robin, I so agree with you. There's somebody out there who needs to hear your particular variation of your story. I guarantee there's a place for it. Uh, a couple more questions. I want to be mindful of your time, Robin. But the significance of the hummingbird, which is prevalent in the book, um, and there's a, a section dedicated to it. And I've, I'm have i thinking about the hummingbird in particular because I'm thinking back to when Rosie, I don't know if you follow her on Instagram, but uh, this was last year sometime. She fostered a nest of hummingbirds and like from the gestation period to their birth and I mean, it was like this whole experience, of course, right? And I know hummingbird has um, very uh, special meaning. And so I was wondering if you could tell us about that for you. Yeah. So for me, the hummingbird is part of also a creation story. Like, um, I guess maybe like you would call it like a myth um, in, in my, in my, tr- like from my ancestors. And so the idea, so the the Mexica, right? So the the Aztecs slash Mexica, um, they had this this story, right? This is what they would say. This is our story, you know, um, that they that they were initially like a wandering tribe, and so they were like wandering in this mythical place called Aslan. And Aslan, people, they maybe they don't know where it is. Like maybe it's somewhere in Mexico, or maybe it's like in like the southwest of this of the United States, you know. And this, right, this all used to be just like one territory. But their their story was that they got a message from a hummingbird. And the hummingbird also was a representation of this energy essence called Huitzilopochtli, um, who they call the hummingbird on the left, right? So this person, uh, this very important energy essence said, follow me. And when you When you get to a place where you see an eagle eating a snake, that's where you're going to build your home. Okay. And so follow, follow, follow the hummingbird and you will find your home. And so they did. And so they were like, okay, we got this vision. um, And so we're going to go. And so they, I think they carried like, um, like sort of like symbolisms of hummingbirds as they walked and they had the vision of the hummingbird. And then eventually they got to what's president present day Mexico city, which back then they called it Tenochtitlan. And there they had the vision where they saw the Eagle eating a snake on a cactus. And that's why now on the Mexican flag, they have that symbol. So the symbol of the Mexican flag is that. And so that is this, this creation story, right? So this is how, Mexico was started. But the idea for me that I took is the hummingbird, that the hummingbird will lead you home, right? If you look at a hummingbird, um, that it's joyful and it's playful, right? And it moves in all different directions and it moves really fast. And it's just like this beautiful image. And so I have a meditation 
in the book where I just asked people to tap into themselves. And the way that I started when we talked about, you know, when we started this conversation and I had that deep knowing that I wanted more than anything to go see my daughter sing. And yet I didn't do it. I didn't listen to my own knowing. I didn't listen to the hummingbird in my heart, right? And so what I ask for people is to quiet down and to listen because we can guide ourselves home. I really believe that, that we can, that we can be the guides, right? We can, like our inner knowing, our ancestors, our dreams, our intelligence, you know, speaks to us all the time. And so often what we just have to really do is listen, is just listen to this hummingbird of our heart that will guide us to where we need to go, right? Maybe it's just one step at a time, but we'll get there. And so that's the really beautiful significance um, of the hummingbird and how I I listen. And again, they call this energy essence, with Huitzilopochtli, the hummingbird on the left. And also um, in the left and the south is our hearts. And so that's why I also equate the hummingbird to the heart, like that it's heart medicine, mm -hmm. that we're listening to the beat of our heart to find us, to take us home. Mm, that's so beautiful. Thank you. So last question, sometimes Rosie will ask this as well, and it's uh, regarding the ethos of the podcast and the namesake of the podcast. And you might have heard Rosie talk about um, the namesake of Radically Loved as it relates to the book. Um, and as it relates to the podcast is the idea that regardless of um, whatever higher power that you believe in, whatever you call it, that we are all radically loved by God, source, universe, you know, whatever it is that you want to call that. Um, and so the question that Rosie typically asks at the end is, um, how do you feel radically loved? And what do you radically loved? And I love this question for you specifically, Robin, because get rooted in, I know you two talked about this in the podcast, the root of radical being root, <laughs> rooted, right? So I just love the synchronicity of this um, and everything that we've talked about really. And so I think it's an appropriate question to ask you to end on. You know, I, I think it's a beautiful question. I think it's such a beautiful question because, you know, when I started on this journey, I, I have to say, I think I, I, I was sad. I was really, I was, I was hurting. I was hurting. I, I was, a, I, I was, you know, I was wounded. Right. And I was trying to find something, right. My soul. Right. But what I found was love. It's really love that I found, which makes me cry, but it's, I found love in my lineage and all the people that came before me that worked so hard and that survived so much, um, you know, where I was their wildest dream, right? This, this Latina girl that gets to write this book, you know, that's, that's, that's love, right? That, you know, looking at my kids, and they're just so joyous and so confident and so happy and so free. Uh, the other day I was telling my husband that I wanted, I'm having a big birthday coming up and I want to buy a piece of art, you know? Um, and I've never really had like a nice piece of art. So I want to buy like, you know, <laughs> like not a print from TJ Maxx, but like from an artist. And one of my daughters, I have two, with like complete confidence was like, mama, you can have one of my drawings. You can put one up of mine. And I was like, oh, yeah, girl. <laughs> She's like, yeah, you're right. I can put one of yours. Like, that's a beautiful draw. Thank you. You know, and it's just like, yes, exactly. Like, yes, you are an artist. And so, you know, that is love. Nature. Nature is nature is a character in this book. The, the 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 natural world that we live in that so many of us are so busy to look at because we're looking at screens or we're rushing in our cars the natural beauty that mother earth donancing gives us like the birds the hummingbird and 
just the rosemary that grows and the wild dandelions and the dogwood trees like that. And, and that's really honestly where source and spirit and God and nature and love speaks to me is in, is, is through nature because I get, I just know without beyond words, beyond words that I'm held and I'm supported and I'm loved and I love laying in the grass and I'm just, I just relax and I just let myself be held. And and I, that's probably when I know that I'm loved the most and I can hear my kids running around and my husband's doing something and I'm just looking up at the sky and I'm just, I'm just held. It's so beautiful. Robin, thank you so much for sharing your journey and for getting this book out into the world for us. And congratulations, because yes, you're right, it is like giving birth and then you send it out into the world and and send it on its way and hope that it spreads its wings and fly. And I have no doubt that it will. It's a gorgeous body of work. Is there um, a place that's best for people to go to find you on the socials, to follow along with you and to purchase the book? I imagine everywhere it's sold, but what's your preference for communication? You know, everywhere books are sold, um, you can do like the the more obvious ones, right? Absolutely. That makes sense. Um, and obviously like Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, but also if you want to support an independent bookseller, you can go to bookshop.org and that supports independent booksellers, which is also important. So I'll take it as I get it. I love it. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, if you go to robinmoreno.com, you can sc- subscribe to my newsletter. So I really love sending newsletters out. That's the way that I feel the most sort of connected. You can subscribe to the podcast. And then on the socials, um, it's Robin and Moreno and also get rooted with Robin Moreno. And that's where I'm putting most stuff. So I would say on Instagram, um, and that feeds into Facebook and then we're moving into the TikToks as well. Cause that's, you know, that's where the kids are these days. Um, but yeah, I, in, in all the ways, but I do, I would say my website and my newsletter is where I write. I do a lot of like, personal writing. And so I stay really connected and I do long form writing and, um, and I can, I have retreats coming up and workshops and things like that. And that way we can start foster community. So it's not just, you know, me talking, you know, at you, but I want to be with you and I want to hear about you. And then we get to be in circle together. And that is what's most important to me. Mm, beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much, Rama. We'll make sure all of those links get into our show notes so you can just look at the info button below and connect with Robin. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. This was, um, this was such a gift. So thank you for being part of my community and asking really thoughtful and insightful questions. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie on Instagram at Rosie Acosta and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.